And, uh, uh, have a lot to cover this evening, so let's just pray and we will get right into it. Uh, so, uh, let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much, Father God, for the Sabbath, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for being with us and for bringing us together. And Father, I pray that again that uh, as we just finish this little holy test, instead of a regular holy quiz, that we can be motivated, Father God, and encouraged to be more into your word. It's, it, it's wonderful, it's a blessing to come and listen to messages every Sabbath, uh, in the morning, the afternoon, and we probably even hear sermons online, on YouTube, or whatever throughout the week. But unless we are in your word for ourselves, uh, Lord, we're not going to make it. And so I pray that we'll be motivated and encouraged to spend much more time in your word. And Father's about to enter this subject that... Um, a subject where there's so much controversy and emotions and uh, opinions, Lord, we want to make sure we stay rooted and grounded in your word, and not on culture, not on feelings, not on emotions, but grounded in what your word says. So I pray that you will please guard my mind guard my words. May you take full possession of me, Father in heaven, that what is said will be edifying, fortifying, to take a bold stand for your truth in these last days. So, Father, please be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, it is no secret that the words of the Apostle Paul have come true in God's beloved remnant, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And what words are those? Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. And let's go to verse 27. Paul here is departing Ephesus. And he is telling the people that they will never, ever see him again. And back in those days when they had no phone, no social media, no nothing, you know, when you leave, you know you're never going to see that person again. And so Paul, in his final words to the people at Ephesus, he says in verse 27 of Acts chapter 20, are we there, Amen. He says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now look at Paul's prophecy. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears." Strong words. Paul is saying, listen, when I leave, there's going to come among you grievous wolves speaking perverse things, drawing away disciples, not after Christ, but after them. And with tears, day and night for three years, I warned you of what was coming. Well, we're here. Now, there are some subjects 
that there's no way to deal with them, but just got to grab the bull by the horns. You do it in love, you do it tactfully, you do it carefully, but you got to grab the bull by the horns. There's no way around it, especially when it's in your face every day. And what am I talking about? It's every day in the news. In fact, literally, almost on a daily basis is frontline news. This entire transgender LGBTQ movement that is taking America and even the world by storm. But this actually goes back centuries. I'm going to read just one, maybe two paragraphs of this book right here. I highly recommend it. Uh, Libido Dominandi. Uh, now, this book was banned in America for many, many years. And it's only recently that you could actually get it in regular platforms. You know, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, whatnot. For many years, you, you couldn't do that. You had to go to a certain uh, connections and sources to get this book because there are many banned books in the land of the free, believe it or not. And I find that fascinating. You, you get pornography free on your cell phone, but some books you cannot get in the land of the free. This used to be one of them. And this is an amazing, amazing book. And uh, I'm just going to read to you a couple of sentences and one thing here at the end. But just in the very beginning of the introduction, and again, this, this is a very politically incorrect message, but I'm praying it's tactful, but it's also very much needed because it's all around us, and sometimes we as a church, we're like, shh, shh, but it's all around us. We, we can't escape it. So here the author writes, um, Pornography is now and has always been a form of control, financial control. Pornography is a way of getting people to give you money, which because of the compulsive nature of the transaction is not unlike trafficking in drugs. So it is for control. And it's showing that it's, going, it's using for political control. And then it makes reference to the book by John Heidenry called What Wild Ecstasy. And it's showing here how throughout the ages all this has been used to control. But coming down to our days here, it says this. Once people are hooked... The culture's mandarins can use the details of their addictions against anyone who goes against the regime. Because when you look behind the scenes, there's actually a movement, an agenda, that has been pushing this for many, many, many years. And then he writes... The subtext of the book is that everyone who opposes sexual liberation will be punished. We're almost there. We're almost there. You can lose your jobs. You can lose your scholarships. You can lose your position. You can lose definitely your reputation if you are not in favor going along with today's view of human sexuality. Where to the point if I say, listen, a man can never become a woman, for me saying that, in many places I will be in physical danger. I highly recommend this book. 
its, it's documents has gone back centuries, and now it's here. Now, I don't want to digress too much, but it's no secret that the world and much of the Christian world has jumped on this LGBTQ bandwagon. And it's also no secret that many SDA local churches and nearly all of our SDA colleges, at least in North America, have jumped on the LGBTQ bandwagon. Just about all of our colleges have LGBTQ clubs on their campuses, and they are welcomed and supported by the school's administration. When I was in college, the school I went to was in full support of SDA Kinship, and SDA Kinship is a group, uh, a, a quote-unquote ministry, if you will, of gay SDAs who want to remain SDAs and remain gay at the same time. In other words, you want to be practicing homosexuals and still be members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is not a secret. So I'm not here, Rumerville, Gossipville. This is known. Sometimes you try to shh, shh, hush it. But let me give you some recent examples of this. This is recent. Green Lake SDA Church in Seattle, Washington, May 12, 13, 2023. 20, this is two months ago. That entire weekend, I don't know if you can read right here, what, what about the Bible, different theological perspectives on LGBTQ, and the featured speaker is a woman named Alicia Johnson, and here it says about her, in 2017, Alicia Johnston came out as affirming of same-sex marriage and transgender people and as a bisexual in a viral video that resulted in her forced resignation as a pastor in the Adventist church. Her story was featured in several news outlets, such as NBC, Religion News. She has since written a book explaining affirming theology uh, for Seventh-day Adventists called The Bible and LGBTQ Adventist. This is the most comprehensive explanation of affirming theology for SDAs. She is working on similar resources for a broader Christian audience. She was the feature speaker that weekend at this SDA church in Seattle. Uh, in March of this year, in Washington Adventist University, okay, in Maryland, you had an entire weekend, LGBTQ pastoral and theolog theological perspectives, and take a look at who one of the main speakers was right there, Alicia Johnson, along with other people who are in support of the LGBTQ lifestyle. This is a, in one of our universities. Um, the Glendale City Church, just here down the road to ours away, uh, here, this is in June, this is last month, the rainbow flag, uh, Jewel City of Pride, Glendale City uh, Church, an open, affirming community, and by the way, this is Adventist Church. God excludes no one, neither do we. Well, I'm sorry. God does exclude people. Jesus, Jesus himself said, many are called, but few are chosen. And it's known, I mean, this is a church here has been around for decades. Uh, it is known as, I mean, they have homosexual elders and they celebrate gay couples anniversaries and whatnot right here in this church. Again, this is not a secret. I'm not telling you nothing that is, you know, not known. La Sierra University. Lavender graduation celebrating the LGPD plus class of 2023, Las University Church of SDA, Service of Chapel, June 3, this is about a month ago, where this Adventist University had a special ceremony for the LGBT students on campus. 
Now, because of this and more, more and more of our academies and colleges and local churches are doing things of this nature, recently, very recently, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists had to issue this statement. This is an official statement put out by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. I quote, The Seventh-day Adventist Church has published clear statements regarding human sexuality, homosexuality, and transgenderism. All these statements were published after a careful study of God's Word found in the Holy Scriptures as it provides the authoritative basis to appropriately understand His will on all issues facing humankind, including that of human sexuality. From our study of God's Word, joined with the reading of the Spirit of Prophecy, we find human sexuality portrayed as a heaven-ordained institution of marriage between one man and one woman. Amen. Amen. In expressing our understanding of God's will on human sexuality, we have done so with Christ-like love and compassion, knowing that all have sinned and fall short of His glorious standard for living. As a church family, we are to be an extension of God's love for all humanity and be intentional in supporting those who struggle with sin in all its forms while nurturing a lifestyle that is in harmony with God's Word. We believe that all sinful humankind can be new creations in Christ as 2 Corinthians 5.17 indicates. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creature, all things have passed away. Now watch this. In recent weeks, General Conference, in recent weeks, some local individuals or sometimes local church organizations in their local settings have sought to provide support for those living alternative human sexuality lifestyles that are inconsistent with our biblical understanding of this issue and published voted statements of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what I just told you. Because all this is going on in local congregations, local organizations, the worldwide church, the general conference, they felt compelled to issue this statement. For some in their local settings, there have even been deliberate efforts to advance the cause of alternative human sexuality lifestyles without regard for the authority of God's Word and the counsel provided in the Spirit of Prophecy. I just showed some examples of that. Although these activities have been locally sponsored through social media, they have been announced far and wide, creating confusion and concern among church members who have been asking for a clear yet kind position on the matter from church leaders at various levels. So when you see local churches and, and univer Adventist universities promoting this lifestyle, we have a right to say, hey, what's going on? Don't we? Well, what's up with this? The General Conference affirms the voted statements on human sexuality, homosexuality, and transgenderism published by the Seventh-day Adventist Church and does not support, endorse, or condone activities that seek to promote human sexuality behaviors not in accordance with God's Word. Amen. Amen. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the General Conference and its divisions will continue to work with the various levels of our church structure to resolve the issues emerging from these locally sponsored activities while maintaining Christ-like love and compassion for all people. Translation, we will have to deal with these organizations. Okay, and I hope they do. Okay, in love, but 
it must be dealt with. Amen. Okay, same way if my, if my children get out of hand, I got to bring out the big guns. I, I, I love them, I, I, but I got to bring them out, don't I? All parents should say the same thing. Amen. The General Conference and other church entities will work diligently according to the precepts and instructions of God's Holy Word to bring clarification and resolution to challenges that are faced. Every member of the church worldwide should stay close to the Word of God in daily living and through earnest prayer ask for God's direct intervention in situations where there is a departure from His divine instructions in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Undoubtedly, there will be more attempts by various groups to undermine the plain instructions from the Word of God and the vote statements of the World Church on these matters. In other words, more is coming. It, it, it's not going away. Okay, it's in our face, in the world. It is there, it's being pushed, there is a agenda behind it. The GCs recognize that, hey, it's here. When individuals wish to share concerns, work closely with local church, conference, union, or institutional leaders in Christ-like love and compassion to address locally sponsored activities that are not in harmony with God's Word. Translation, in a Christ-like way, stand up against it. Now, I am here to tell you that I am standing in full support of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Okay? I, I, I am not for offshoots. I am not for any self-supporting ministry that is in opposition to the worldwide church. There are many self-supporting ministries that are working in harmony with the worldwide church, those I support. But I'm standing here in full 100% support of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And I praise God that they issued this statement of affirmation of the truth that we find in God's Word. Now, it was C.S. Lewis who said, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. When everyone's going in one direction and one person's going the opposite direction, now that person is going to seem to the whole world like you are an idiot. What is wrong with you? You are a fool. The world thinks that we are the crazy ones because we don't embrace what the culture of today is embracing. They look at us and say we are the unloving, unkind, bigoted ones. Now we are running in the opposite direction, at least we should. And we want to take as many people with us as we can to get away from the cliff. Because what is happening in our world today is utter and complete foolishness, madness. It is unbelievable what is going on. And we must not lose our mission. We must not lose our God-given mission because of the foolishness, the madness that is out there in the world. And my friends, it is only a matter of time before we are confronted with this issue here. This homosexual LGBTQ plus has already hit many of our academies and colleges, and sadly, it has not been rebuked but embraced. As I just showed some examples. It's madness. And I'll show in just a minute, but we, as Seventh-day Adventists, as members of God's remnant people, we must hold the line. What is happening in America, what is happening in girls' sports, 
what is happening in our school campuses, in public schools, as it relates to this gender confusion, is complete and utter foolishness. It is madness. When Target is selling women's bathing suits that are tuck-friendly bathing suits for men, tuck-friendly, just think about that. That's crazy. For their Pride Month, Target has partnered with a clothing line called Aprilin, or Aprilin, which is a London-based company which is headed by a transgendered Satanist named Eric Carnell. The development of all this came from this guy who is a transgender Satanist, and, and he wrote here, being called a demon is something I can cope with. And the idea of a trans demon is pretty blank cool. Most of my work focuses on gothic or dark and satanic imagery juxtaposed with bright colors and LGBTQ plus positive messages. This is the guy that Target has partnered with. When North Face has a guy with a mustache wearing a rainbow dress as their spokesman inviting people to explore the outdoors where there will be, quote, hiking, community, art, lesbians, and lesbians making art, end quote. That's crazy. When Disney has a guy with a mustache wearing a dress welcoming little children into the enchanted chamber, that is crazy. And we'll talk about Disney in, in, in a bit. When Kohl's targets children and infants to promote this LGBTQ agenda, that is foolishness. When reading approved when approved reading material in the school system is so pornographic that when parents read excerpts of it at a public school board meeting and the parents are told to stop reading, reading it because it's inappropriate, but yet it is appropriate for children to read it, I mean, how messed up in the head must you be? You can see it online. This one pastor gets up. I'm reading from a book that my child can check out at this school's library, and he must read it, and the, the school board has said, sir, that is inappropriate. Oh, but yet my child can check it out and read it? When churches are flying the rainbow flag and affirming sexual sin, that is beyond blasphemy. It's madness. And when SDA churches start promoting this Pride Month, when I was in college almost 30 years ago, my college celebrated Pride Month. I mean, take a look at these books here. These are Christian books, quote-unquote Christian books. Still Stacy, my gay Christian coming-of-age story. Queerfully and Wonderfully Made, a guide for LGBTQ plus Christian teens. Welcoming and Affirming, a guide to supporting and working with LGBTQ Christian youth. This is crazy. 
And I fear because if the Lord doesn't come soon, I have two children. If the Lord doesn't come in the next 15 years, which I, I hope not, but where are my kids going to go to school if even our own universities are beginning to push this stuff? When the L.A. Dodgers invite, then uninvite, and then invite again, the group called Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, which is an anti-Christian hate group whose motto is, go forth and sin more. This group is a group of men who dress up as nuns, and they were awarded at Dodger Stadium. This is about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. And in their performance, there is a guy who was simulating nailed on a cross like Jesus, and another guy is doing a pole dance around Jesus. I was going to have a picture of that, but I said, no, uh -uh. That is beyond madness. I mean, I saw that. I'm like, you have a guy on a cross and this one guy wearing basically a thong doing a pole dance around a crucified Jesus. And I'm like, it's like C.D. Brooks one time said, if the Lord doesn't come soon, he will have to resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize. In light of what is happening in our culture today, I think that we need to be very, very clear on this subject. Not so much political, but biblical values are being scorned, attacked, sneered, mocked, ridiculed in our culture. Now, what culture does is culture. Now, I mean, that's the world. But the moment it starts to infiltrate into the lives of people and the church, we need to speak up. In love, but we need to speak up. And we forget there is a demonic agenda that is after especially our children. Because there is an emphasis on hijacking our children today by indoctrinating them at such a young and tender age. This here, New York City drag marchers chant, we're coming for your children. During Pride event, it's right here, LGBT active activists in New York City, in New York City's annual drag queen parade chanted, we're here, we're queer, we're coming for your children. We're here, we're queer, we're coming for your children. Well, I got news for you. You're coming close to my kids. Sorry. Not going to happen. But children, they're like wet cement. Very impressionable. And when you begin to sow seeds into their young minds through things like what Disney is doing today, in fact, one of the leaders of Disney said that they wanted to, to, to fill as much of queerness into the programming as we can. By next year, they want 50% LGBTQ into their programming. Now, I don't want to get on the tangent here, but I, I, at the school, everyone knows Gomez is anti-Disney. About five, six years ago, the Lord convicted me on that. I mean, no. Disney has declared war on everything that God stands for. They declared war on sexuality, on the family. They declared war on all that is holy, just, and good. And I do believe that we should have no issue in this and totally boycott Disney. I'm sorry. Disney is evil. Okay, it is. It's much more than Mickey Mouse. 
Well, can you all could Google later on what happens at Disneyland at night? Between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., you, you find out what happens at Disneyland at night. Okay? It's, it's not a secret. But not only is Disney full of spiritualism and witchcraft and sorcery, but now they're pushing this into the minds of children. Today, we are in the place that if we believe the truth and speak the truth, you'll be deplatformed, silenced, called a bunch of names, transphobic, homophobic, bigot, racist, intolerant. Now, let's be clear about this. We don't hate. Amen. And anyone is welcome to come through those doors. Atheist, Muslim, Hindu, homosexual, transgender, you are more than welcome to come and sit in these pews during church service. In fact, we hope you do. This is a safe place for you. No one will attack you. No one will yell at you. No one will hate you. No one will scream at you. If you're hungry, we'll feed you. If you need clothing, we'll help you out. Anyone is welcome to come into this church. But let one thing be also clear. Our church exists for Christians. And even though everyone is welcome to come in, there's one thing that we will never, ever do. At least I pray we never do. And what is that? We will not change the Bible to fit our culture. We will not change the Bible to be accepted by our culture, to be loved by our culture. In fact, Jesus says that if the world loves you, something's wrong, not with the world, but with us. Because the world is not to love us. The world is to hate us. So anyone is welcome. If you're homosexual, you're welcome here. But to be a member of God's church, there are conditions. And there's certain things that we cannot partake of and be members of God's church at the same time. So, I don't know about you all, but I don't want to be applauded by a culture that is under the influence of Satan and then stand before God and be rejected by Christ because I stood with the world and not with him. Wow. 613. You see, when Adam sinned, the human race did two things in Adam. The human race did two things in Adam. Number one, we rebelled against God. And two, we redefined good and evil. I mean, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when Adam and Eve bit the fruit, they not knew what good and evil was, but as time went by, sinful humanity began to redefine good and evil. And when we rebelled, God is no longer the final authority. When we rebel, God is no longer the one who decides what is good for us. When we rebel, God is no longer our Lord. And whenever we get rid of God, watch this, whenever we get rid of God, we begin to act like God. How so? When we get rid of God, we begin to act like God, and as God, we begin to make the rules as we go. This is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad, and culture has been redefining good and evil since then. Now, 
this is where it gets good. Please follow. And I'm going to have to cut the short in righteousness. But please follow. Israel, the nation that God chose to be a special nation, a holy nation, from the day they left Egypt, Israel was always tempted to follow and worship the gods of the nations around them. The gods of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, all the other ites the Bible mentions. Now, these nations, they had a few things in common. But what they had in common the most was the worship of these idols, the worship of these gods. And in the worship of these gods, there was two things that were always mixed together. What were they? Sex and idolatry. When you look at pagan history up until this day, in pagan worship, in the occult, sexuality and the occult, sexuality and paganism, sexuality and idolatry go hand in hand together. You can't separate them. In ancient times, you have temple prostitutes with gross perverted, I mean sexually perverted rites that are so graphic and grotesque that I, I dare not mention them here. But here's a question. Why is it that Satan is so interested in our sexuality? We're in the last days. And look at the sexually perverse world we live in. Because we not only live in a sexually saturated world, we live in a totally confused, upside-down, sexually saturated world. Where today we cannot even define what is a woman. What's a woman? Don't know if you saw that, but the Supreme Court Justice, they asked her, can you tell me what a woman is? Oh, I don't know what a woman is. I'm like, really? Can you define women? Uh, can you define women? No. Where a man can say he's a girl, and we say, uh, no, you're not, you're labeled a bigot, transphobic, whatever. Why is it? I mean, forget adultery and prostitution and pornography, but now throw in their homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, redefining sexuality on all levels. Why is it that Satan is attacking our sexuality so much in these last days? Why? Please get this. There's two reasons why. One, because sexuality is the most sacred and the most core thing about us. It is something that we share only with our spouse. Not our children, not family, not friends, but only with our spouse. It is the deepest and most sacred thing about us. In Genesis 4, 1, where it says that Adam knew his wife, it's a way of knowing someone in a way that we cannot know anyone else except our spouse. It is so sacred, protected, so good, so shielded, so sheltered from the world, and that is the part that Satan is after. But it gets a little deeper than that. It gets a little, it gets a little deeper, deeper than that. Now, you know this, SAS. What is God waiting for us to do? Say it again. When the character of Christ is reproduced among his people, Christ will come and claim us as his own. Now, we were made in the image of who? 
Big question. What makes the image of God? We forget about this. It's a simple truth, but we forget about it. Let's go to Genesis 1. Back to the beginning. Genesis 1, and let's go to verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. Man by himself is not the image of God. Woman by herself is not the image of God. Man and woman together is the image of God. And that's one reason why God hates divorce so much. Because what does divorce do? It breaks that image. You see, as far as we know, human beings are the only beings in this universe that were made in God's image. Angels are not made in God's image. Angels don't have families and procreate. Only we do. So there's something in the family unit that enables us to produce the image of God in a way that the universe can understand God's character. Are you following me? Because the human race was created for the purpose of reflecting God's character as God's exhibit A in the great controversy. Now we're taking it deeper. When Satan accused God of all these things, God said, all right, fine, I'm going to create a new species that's going to show you exactly who I am, what I am like. That was God's purpose in creating the human race. So that when, when someone from planet who knows way out there, what is God, what, what are you God like? God's going to say, look at them. Look at them. That's, that's what I'm like. So watch this. We serve how many gods? There's only one God. But that God is manifested in how many persons? Three. Three. Don't ask me to explain. There's not a human being on earth that can explain that. I believe it because the Bible teaches it. Okay, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, not three gods, one God in three persons. I'm not even going to bother explaining that. It's simply impossible. Okay, I could try, but it's impossible. Then watch this. Man and woman combined in the capacity of marriage have the ability to, to, produce, to produce that third. Man and man can't do that. Woman and woman can't do that. Only man and woman can do that. Amen. Homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, divorce, adult, it destroys all of that. And in these last days, as we're getting closer and closer to the end, when God is he's waiting for his people to produce his character, all of a sudden, bam, what do we have these days? Five years ago, we didn't have this. This happened almost overnight. I mean, seriously, five, seven years ago, we, we didn't have this. Now it is in your face. Because Satan is trying to do all he can to prevent the image of God being reproduced among, among us. Now, it gets deeper. We're, 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 okay, we're going to cut it short in righteousness because we're not even we're still in the beginning here. But I want to show them something before, before time runs out. So because of this, we should not be surprised to find drag queens and all of this perversion being forced upon little children. 
You have, you have churches that are having drag queen events. You know that, right? It's, it's crazy. Why is Satan going after the most sacred part? Now you know why. But Israel was constantly being bombarded by these gods. They were always tempted to follow these gods. They were enamored by these gods. Now, one of the main gods was Baal. That's actually Baal, little, little dude right there. When we read the Bible about Baal, that's him right there. Okay? That little guy. You can imagine why. I mean, if you read Isaiah, God actually, God actually makes fun of these gods. I mean, God, God says, listen, you look at these gods, I mean, he can't move. You have to carry him. He can't see. He, you made him with your own hands, and you pick him up, you put him right there. He can't move. He can't see. He can't breathe. He can't hear, and you bow down to it. Isaiah 46, I mean, God, God makes fun of these gods. It's crazy. Now, Baal, he always wanted to replace God. And by the way, you know what the word Baal means? The word Baal means Lord. Lord. He always wanted to place God. Now, when people worship Baal, some say this was his wife, but Ishtar came next. You couldn't separate them. Ishtar was the god of sexuality, the goddess of sexuality, the goddess of perversion, of fertility. Israel began to worship Ishtar. Easter was originally the celebration of Ishtar, the Assyrian and Babylonian goddess of fertility and sex. Her symbols like the egg and the bunny were still our fertility and sex symbols. Um, after Constantine decided to Christianize the empire, Easter was changed to represent Jesus, but at its roots, Easter was Ishtar. So Easter, Ishtar, same thing. Now, we're going somewhere. Stay with me. Another god that was worshipped was the god Moloch. Moloch. Now, Moloch was the craziest of them all. Because Moloch demanded human sacrifice. And this is what actually they would do. And Israel, Israel literally did that. How messed up must you be in the head to do that to your own child? Those hands were hollow, and they would put firewood in there and light that wood, and the hands were red hot, and they would put the child on the red hot hands of Moloch, and the child would fry alive. I got two kids. Yeah, I, <laughs> How possessed must you be? I couldn't do that to my dogs, much less to my own children. Dude, <laughs> Israel did that. Why would someone offer human sacrifice to a God and not only that, their own children? Well, this God promised that whoever offered a sacrifice would get blessings, fertility, wealth, rain. So people would actually do this. They would offer to this demonic idol of Moloch, believing that he would give them success in life. Now, as time went on, these gods were actually expelled from Greco-Roman culture. Even though the Greeks and the Romans practiced sexual immorality that was just as bad as this, because in Greek and Roman culture, pedophilia, homosexuality were so common. In fact, they were so common that the value of humanity was very little, but value of sexuality and exploitation and sexual exploration was very, very high. But with the advancement of Christianity, these gods... Baal, Ishtar, Moloch, and all these other gods, they went, 
shall we say, into exile. But now let me ask you a question. Think about it now. These gods, in every culture of the world, they go by different names, but the same gods, they ruled the world with the exception of Israel, and Israel many times went after these gods. For thousands of years, these gods were it. And when Christianity hit the scene, do you think that these gods just went bye-bye? I got news for you. The gods are back. And I'm going to show you how, and then we'll have to conclude, and we'll see the rest maybe for another time. For another time. But how is it that these gods have returned? They returned to America and the West in particular. Now, why is that? Because we as a nation have departed from the truth, and this nation in particular has left its biblical foundations. Lines became blurred between animal and human. Animal life was elevated and human life was devalued. It's funny because today, you could go to jail for animal cruelty, but not for killing babies. Are you following me? Now watch this. Baal brought the idea that you can make your own God. You can be your own God, your own truth. Today, absolute truth doesn't exist. Do as you please. That's Baal. Now, this nation was built on Judeo-Christian values. Was it perfect? No. But it was built on Judeo-Christian values and principles where human life was valued, where sexuality had its boundaries, parameters, safeguards where homosexuality was not acceptable. If we had time, I'd show you that in America, homosexuality was actually illegal until 1925. I don't know if you guys knew that. In America, homosexuality was illegal until 1925. But a lot of other things were not acceptable in our history, but in time, praying in schools went out the window, Ten Commandments were no longer allowed, all that was called unconstitutional, and what happened was Baal took over the American culture. Bible's out, prayer is out, Ten Commandments are out, now it's do your own thing, have your own truth, do as you please, live how you want. And with that, now comes Ishtar. Ishtar is the sexual perversion, or in other words, the sexual revolution. It's abandoning moral safeguards for instant gratification. Unrestrained sexual gratification. In other words, there's no thought of, no desire for, or any desire of connection with children. You want sexual satisfaction, sexual indulgence, a sexual perversion that actually leads to STDs, leads to death, destroys marriages, and the children produce bisexual sin these children needed to be brought somewhere. And now we have the third God that's made a comeback, which is Moloch. Are you following me? Baal arrived, do as you please, do what you want. You're your own God, you have your own truth. When that happened, Ishtar, thank you very much, sex revolution. 
The whole sexual revolution, make love, not war. No, do, what, what do you want? Just get free sex, no commitment, nothing, just sexual immorality. And the children, the pregnancies of that sexual revolution, those children, where are they going to go? Now comes Moloch. Hitler killed six million. Moloch has killed 60 million babies in our country. The United States became a blood-soaked high altar place for Moloch. Children were offered on the altar of Moloch. Women sacrificed children in those days to gain favor with this God so that their, 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 their grains will be fruitful, prayers will be answered. Today, in this country, a child hinders your life. A child takes your time, your energy, your education. It hinders your career and future earning capabilities. And we have evangelists that are called celebrities who boast about their careers after they ended the life of their unborn child. And they say, if you want to have a child, then your dreams will come to an end. Your dreams will be hindered because a child is just going to get in your way. And so Moloch has simply changed his face, and today Moloch is called Planned Parenthood. Same unclean spirit. In ancient times, you offer your child to have success. Today, you get rid of your child so the child does not hinder your success. Mola came after Ishtar. And watch this. The reason why abortion had to be necessary here is because when you allow sexual re revolution, which follows abandoning God, the truth and the morals of God's words, sexual revolution comes in, and when you have sex that has no boundaries, you have babies that don't belong anywhere except at the altar of Moloch. That's exactly what's happening today. Are you following this, my friends? You following this? So today, instead of enjoying sex, we worship sex. And therefore, there are no boundaries. Quote, unquote, love wins. Love decides what is right and what is wrong. But for us, for Christians, God is love. And God is good. And he sets the guidelines, the parameters on what is good. No parent in their right mind will allow their child to decide what is good or bad based on their emotion purpose of that day. Think I'm allowing my six-year-old to tell me what is good and what is bad? No. Sorry, uh-uh. And, and it, it drives me insane these days. I, I see I see it. Yeah, I see it at the academy, I see it at the other place. I'm amazed today as to how well parents obey their children. You all know what I'm talking about? And, and I've been told, well, I, I've sat in seminars, seriously, in seminars, in, 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 you know, for, for teachers and whatnot, even past seminars. You know, listen, well, today for children, a simple yes or no will not do. Uh, in my house it does. If mom and dad say no, it's no. Why? Because I say so. Go to bed. Got a problem with that? We, 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 you know, we always are dealing with that. It's amazing. But there are rules, there are rights and wrongs that are established by a supreme being who we believe wants the best for us. 
God created us. He created nature. He, he doesn't want what, something bad for us. And God gave us amazing gifts. And one of those gifts is a union between a man and a woman. And God is not homophobic. God is not transphobic. He is simply a loving father who knows best. We're closing. We're closing. And when we rebel against God and do what we do or do what we want to do, you know what we do? We end up creating another God. And we create another God that is according to our lust. Now, again, I got to close. There's a whole lot more. But we're not talking about bad people. We're not attacking people. We're talking about principalities and powers. And they all want something from us just like God does. God wants us to be holy, happy, to enjoy life with our family. He, God wants husbands to love their wives, wives to love their husbands. He wants us to be free from lust and passions, free from sin. And today the whole world is living according to their lust and their passions. Like we just read. Let's, in closing, let's read it again. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. Romans 1, let's go to verse 24. We're closing. Romans 1.24. Romans 1.24. I mean, Paul could have written this last night. He wrote this 2,000 years ago. Paul says, Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which is meat. So the man left the natural use of the woman, burned in the lust one for another, men with men, working that which is against, against nature, contrary to nature. And God said, fine, you want that? Fine, go ahead and have it. I mean, you can more into it, but when God did that, now comes the consequences of the sin. Now we have to stop here, but I want to make it clear. I'm standing in full support of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in issuing that statement. Number two, we don't hate anybody. Here I walked to Bethlehem years ago, met some gay couples, and they, even they had tears in their eyes. Well, I can't come to this church. Why not? Well, because this is my wife, this is my husband, and I say, hey, you're welcome to come join us. Please come join us. We want you here. And we pray that the grace of God will convict and bring victory over that sin. You are welcome here. But to be a member here, there are certain things that we just cannot be. I mean, there's no such thing as a Christian adulterer. There's no such thing as a Christian thief. I mean, should we create safe spaces for Christian thieves and Christian adulterers and Christian murderers? No. Do we hate those people? No. Same field homosexual, transgender, you're welcome here. If you're hungry, we'll feed you. You need help, we'll clothe you. you need a ride, we'll give you. We, we, will, we will help, we will love you, but we will not do, we will not endorse that lifestyle. And that does not mean we hate you. 
In fact, it's because we love you that we tell you the truth. So let that be clear. Just because we don't agree with you does not mean we hate you. Maybe we'll continue this some other time. There's a lot more here to share. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So how about people like um, uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Zariah, Michelle, Jeremiah, who never married, but yet they were men of God and kept Right. Them. Yeah, they, they developed the character of God, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is it was, it was never God's plan. It was never God's plan for human beings to be single. That was never God's plan. Now, sin has messed things up. There are some people that are perfectly happy being single. Okay. But uh, celibacy was never part of God's plan. We are sexual creatures. And I tell my kids at the academy all the time, listen, I mean, when we talk about these things, if you have sexual desires, congratulations, you're normal. Okay? If you don't have sexual desires, something's wrong with you. If you don't have a desire to get married, that's not normal. Okay, it is normal to want to be married and have a family. That's the way God intended to meet. Okay, there are some cases Daniel was made a eunuch, more than likely. Uh, he couldn't have a family. You know, and as far as we know, we don't know. Jesus wasn't married. Okay, no, but, but, yes, go ahead. Right, right. So there are some exceptions. Okay, there are some exceptions, but I was about to say this. As far as we know, Jesus wasn't married. But question, if Jesus would have gotten married, would that have been a sin? Would that have been a sin? So would there have been a problem if Jesus got married? No, that's not a sin. I don't think he was married. But at the same time, at the same time, the last verse of John. The last verse of John says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose, even the world itself would not contain the books that should be written. There's a whole bunch of things that Jesus did that we wouldn't know. Now, I'm not saying he was married. I don't think he was. But what I'm saying is if he did get married, what's the problem with that? No problem. Is it, is it a sin to have a family? No. Again, I don't, I'm not saying he did. But there are individuals that, yeah, for X circumstances, never got married, and they were able to do so. But that's not God's plan. But my okay. Is they, can still have. they can still have, they can still have to a certain extent, but watch this. But watch this. They don't reveal it to the fullest extent that a family can. They can't. Okay, like for example, Enoch. When did Enoch begin his walk with God? When Methuselah was born. Now, he was walking with God. But when Methuselah was born, something clicked in Enoch. That, I mean, Ellen White says beautiful statement. She says that, that, that when he saw the love that his baby boy had for him and the love that he had for his baby boy, it clicked. Wait a minute, there's something here about God. And that's something that even Elijah and Daniel never experienced. I mean, those of you that are parents, I, I, told, I told Justin, Justin Mello the other day, like a week before his child was born, I told him, listen, the moment you hear that baby cry, the moment your life is forever changed. The parents, am I right? Yes. Your life is forever changed. The, I said, I'm almost crying here just thinking about I mean, <laughs> I mean and, 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 and there's something about that, about the human family, that a godly, consecrated family, it reveals something about God's nature that the entire heavenly universe is saying, oh, now I see what God is like. So yeah, those, those men did have, but they didn't have it in the, the way that God intended it to be. And God is merciful. 
in those ways, okay, you know. But, 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 yeah. So, anyway, uh, my, fr yeah, go ahead. Can I give this message in the morning? <laughs> uh, we'll pray about it. <laughs> we'll pray about it. So, all right, but maybe I'll give the part two because we're, I'm only like a fourth of the way done through the study and out of the SAS. So, all right, my friends. So, next week there will be SAS, even though there's camp meeting. Uh, so, we will be here. I think it'll be either Mel or Figures that'll be doing it. And then, yeah, SAS is going to continue. Can't meet or no can't meet. So, 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 so we're here. Unfortunately, there's no revival, but, you know, uh, this will be our revival time here. And, um, and uh, let's just keep moving forward. Amen? And we'll have the grades, the test results <laughs> next time. So, all right, let, 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 let's, let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much, Father, for your many blessings. We thank you for the clarity of your word. And I pray that tonight's message was clear. Father, I feel in any way you should perform, please, may your Holy Spirit do the rest. And I pray, Father God, that we can, Lord, be going the opposite direction. The whole world's going in one direction. And no matter how crazy we may look, Father in heaven, we know that you want us to go in the exact opposite direction. Because that's the narrow road that leads to life. I pray, Father, that we can be loving and caring and compassionate to all those who are living in sin. We're all sinners in need of grace, Father in heaven. And the homosexual is in no worse condition than we are if we're holding on to sin. So, Father, please, may we surrender all sin to you and help us to indeed reflect your character, your image, that others may be drawn to you. As we depart, Father God, it's still the Sabbath. May we keep it holy, Father God. May we guard the edges and bring us back next time to continue learning and studying and worshiping, Father God, and drawing closer to you. Give us a good week, Father God, a week of victory over sin, over temptation, and all that closer to your soon return. Be with your church, Father God. I thank you for the statement that was issued by the World Church. Father, it is your church. We praise God for that. It is under attack. Uh, there, there's a lot of issues, but it is your church, and we stand in full support and defense of it. So, Lord, be with us now. We thank you. We praise you, Father God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm books, please, please return your psalm books. And have a blessed week. Oh, okay. I'm going to go visit my kids. Oh, okay. And um, the other thing, I think Daniel, my opinion, mm -hmm. did have the image of Jesus. Because how did he know in chapter 4 of Daniel oh, no, yeah, that did. the fourth person yeah. there was the Son no, of no, God? No, he did. Yeah, I don't know that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. But you say not to the